Hello friends! Welcome to the Socks for Mom podcast. My name is Becky and I'm coming to you today from East Texas where it's been overcast most of the day and it's rained a little bit. I'm sitting in the brightest spot in my house in my sewing room in front of a window to get some light. So welcome if you are a crafter of any kind, if you're a lover of wool, if you like to spin, knit, crochet, then grab a cup of coffee or tea and sit down here and visit with me. Welcome, I'm so glad you could come today. You can find me on Instagram as Socks for Mom. You can find me on Ravelry as Socks for Mom, where we do have a podcast group. And if you're new to the podcast, please jump on over there and introduce yourself so we can get to know you. Um, and I also have a very old blog that I started a long time ago called knittingintherockies.wordpress.com. I don't write much on it anymore, but I do. Um, I do. I'm on it. So that is where you can find me. So let's get started. Um, I'll start with two finished objects, or one's a half finished object. I will start with the chili pepper socks. Um, I have been working on this. This is my pattern. It's my vanilla sock pattern with a little interest and I've been using Drops Fable. Which I actually like. It's a little bit splitty but um, I'm anxious to see how it washes up because it's very economical. This color is not sure if they have colors or they just put a number on it. I kind of think it was sunset or I'm not I'm not sure about that. Anyways I'm doing a little bit of an experiment here. I'm knitting these on a size zero. It's a 64 stitch sock. I will knit it on a 2.25 for my daughter who has a larger foot and I will knit the same stitch count on a maybe a three millimeter or 2.75 for my husband and I'm hoping that will work and then I could use the same pattern for all three of us rather than casting on different sizes which I normally do. So this is a free pattern on Ravelry. It's called the Chili Pepper Sock and I'm halfway done and the other thing I am fi have finished I am wearing yes it's the Diamond Fizz it is done at last! A billion picots, tiny little picots, bound off. Uh, as you know, I thought I would never get through this. It's, um, it was a great knit till I got to this part. And then it was quite tedious. I will pop a picture in to show it modeled. But it's a lovely shawl by Boo Knits. And this podcast today, we're going to have a little show and tell of some other Boo Knits that I have knit because I, I have knit at least nine or ten of her designs. She is one of my favorite shawl designers. This yarn is 100% Tessa Silk. It's by a dyer in Germany called Dye for Yarn. I will put her link down below. And the color is Bleached Dead Rosewood. I had just a little bit left over. I believe this shawl had about 760 yards in it maybe. Um, I am reminded once again how much I do love lace weight shawls. It's so light, it's so airy. I will be able to wear it through the summer to keep the chill off and the air conditioning. Now I will say that Tessa Silk, Silk doesn't keep the chill off like wool does, but even a wool shawl, you can wear it in the summertime in air conditioning or at night if you're in a colder climate. 
and it will keep that chill off. So this, once again, is the Diamond Fizz. It has a lot of beads in it. I don't really remember how many, probably around 600. But, um, and I use the Mayukis, which are my favorite little triangle beads. So that's my finished object. This sweater is by Jen Steingass, and it was the second runner-up in the March Madness um, knitting, I don't know what, what they call it, the Mason Dixon sisters, or Mason Dixon, they're not sisters, are they? The Mason Dixon knitters. Um, do this every year where knitters submit uh, projects or designs and it's run just like a March Madness where it narrows, 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 narrows and there were two left and it was this and it was Andrea Mowry's Weekender sweater which I love and I want to knit but I'm not going to knit it until all my Make 9 are done <laughs> because I'm really uh, dedicated to getting my Make 9 knits done before I venture off into other lands. So this is so pretty. It is in a worsted weight and I told you I'd finish it but I didn't because like I said I've cut back. I'm down to the waist, the hip increases. I've done the waist shaping and as you can see I put these little bulb pins on because I'm now increasing every seven rows before I was decreasing just to make it come in a little bit at the waist. But it is wool. It's Cascade 220. It will be getting warm here soon. In fact, I've got the air conditioning on right now and I know I won't want to have that heavy weight of wool in my hands. So I will finish this soon. As soon as I can knit more so that is the other thing I've been working on. Now I'd like to spend a little bit of time. Um, I want to do a shout out to Bev who designed this shawl. She is one of my favorite designers. So I thought I would have a little bit of show and tell as I showed you some of my Wonderland project bags. So let's start. I don't know what is in which bag, but I'm going to start with my newest bag, which I know you've seen on Instagram if you follow me, because I'm very excited about it. It's the Wonderland Procession 3 zippered bag. I used Donna's tutorial in a pickle. Hi Donna, thank you. She has an excellent tutorial. So if you guys want to make a bag with all this kind of detail in it, um, then check out her tutorial on YouTube. She has three of them and actually she's added a fourth with some modifications because this bag has detail like I've never sewn before. And it was a lot of fun. I absolutely adore the fabric, of course. It's Wonderland fabric by Rifle Paper Company. It is so soft. This bag has three zippers. It has the outside zipper. It has the top zipper. And then there's one inside right here. But let's see what else is on the inside. It's a Boo Knit Shawl. Now this shawl is, let me see if I can hold it up. This is the Morticia. And it's kind of funny that it's in this bag, which is my favorite bag, because this is probably the shawl that I wear the most. You probably think this looks familiar because this is our giveaway today that I'm getting ready to announce. And it has the 
uh, mad tea party fabric on the bottom it's got that gorgeous cobalt blue caterpillar dots that's screen printed with the gold flex and what I like about this one is it has all these fun colors on the inside um, it's really getting washed out here sorry so this is a great little bag um, usually this is what I put socks in but I've decided, I think this might be, since I've had all these shawls in these bags, it has given me the idea that this would make a great idea to store your shawls. And I would love to know how you guys store all the shawls that you make. But I might just have to make up a bunch of these to store all my shawls, then they would be protected. So, let's see what's in this bag. There are two things, because there is a winner in here. There's this one. Let's see. Oh, this was another mystery knit along. And it was done in celebration with something they do over in Portugal and South America. It's the dance macabre. macabre. And it's the, the celebration that they do to celebrate people who've died or I'm not, I can't really remember. But this, I love this shawl. I love this shawl so much that I actually made my mother one in black. It's the one that she picked. It's a really cool bottom here. So this is the Dance Macabre and let me see if I could tell you the color. Uh, the color is called Bloodthirsty and the beads that I picked, I picked these um, Toho round silver lined garnet beads because I thought they looked like little drops of blood. <laughs> it is dance Dance Macabre. Oh, here it is. The name of the shawl comes from the music written in 1874 by the French composer. I'm not going to say that name. Um, dance Macabre immediately lets your imagination wander to dancing skeletons in graveyards. But I do love this one. It's beautiful too. So those are just a little shout out to Boo Knits in case you might want to knit some of her shawls. Go check her out on, on Ravelry. She's great. Now it is time to draw for prizes. The last podcast I asked all of you how you set your gussets up when you knit socks. Surprisingly enough, most of the people who answered it actually use double point needles <laughs> which really didn't help me much but you answered and I provide so I'm going to draw I've put everybody's name in here and I'm going to draw one out now and it is Sparky 136 so can you please Send me a message on Ravelry with your address and I will get this sent to you. I'm going to do this again. Since I finished my um, Diamond Fizz, which has been on the needles a year and a half, possibly two years, I would like to do a UFO knit along. And I'm going to tell you about that in a little bit, but I want it to run through July 4th. I want it to run through July 4th because in a few minutes I'm going to go to Master Knitting and I'm going to tell you a little bit about knitting in the colonial times in the United States. 
And so July 4th, of course, is when we celebrate our independence. So this knit along will run until July 4th and I will make another one of these for that prize drawing. So I'll start a thread over there and I want you to look through all your stuff and I want you to find, you can do as many as you want to. I will enter your name in every single time you finish something. And what I would like is that you go over to the thread and you list all the things that are UFO, unfinished objects, things that you have not really wanted to knit on. But I will tell you, I am so glad I finished that. And once we get through them, um, you know, we might have to slug through some, but it's really great when they're done. But if you're still not feeling the love when you're knitting it, you know what? It's time to frog it. It's time to frog it and use that yarn for something else. Repurpose it. So that knit along is going to start as soon as I get that thread up. You make a list of the things you would like to get accomplished. And as you finish them, you post your picture in the thread and we will have a prize drawing at the end. And that will be great because I have some other things I need to finish. Okay, we're going to take a little break and I'm going to come back with you and I will talk to you a little bit about colonial knitting. Okay, I'm back and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about colonial or knitting in colonial times in the United States because I've started researching for the Master Knitting program and I've just found some interesting facts that I think particularly those in the U.S. might find interesting or um, you may find it interesting if you live in another part of the world. I don't know. but. History is one of my favorite subjects. It's what I majored in in college. And um, I'm sorry about the glare on my glasses. My husband and I, we both got glasses that are those transition lenses and neither one of us likes them. But we're gonna have to stick it out through the year so my glasses may get darker and they may get lighter depending on the sun. But let's chat a little bit about some history. So, um, by the end of the 17th century, that's the 1600s, we don't have any evidence that spinning wheels came over on the Mayflower, but they were shipped over shortly after that. There's evidence that, that ships that came a little bit later um, did bring spinning wheels. But of course, people back then knew how to spin just using a drop spindle of some, some type. So, um, but American household labor met the requirements for woven and knit items. So in the colonies, the average American household they provided their own clothing for their family. But as the colonies grew in numbers, and of course there were a lot of people coming over that were bachelors or um, non-families, as the colonies grew in numbers, the demand for the products also grew. So by the end of the 17th century, um, the skills that were essential were dyers, combers, weavers, spinners, and knitters. Most average people knew how to do that. And when supply could not keep up with demand, many townships established quotas and ordinances, which I found this totally fascinating <laughs> that they actually could carry this out. So let me explain what I mean by that. So selectmen, that was their title, would study each family's capacity um, and of what they 
did in a day. <laughs> They would study each family's capacity and they rated it in accordance with other employment the family um, might pursue. And they set the amount of fiber the women, girls, and boys in that family needed to spend, not only for themselves, but for the community as a whole. They were fined for noncompliance. So I just thought this was an extraordinary assumption of authority over a family's private affairs <laughs> that I just can't even see something like that happening today. But spinning schools were established. Now all of this, remember, all of this was before the Revolutionary War. This was these were colonies that were set up over here. Spinning schools were set up and established. In Virginia, the Virginia Assembly, um, they would give, they would charge 10 pounds of tobacco for 12 pairs of worsted or woolen stockings knit from colonial yarn. In Massachusetts, the colony, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they taxed coaches and carriages to support spinning schools. In Boston, um, Boston did it a different way. That sounds kind of fun. They whetted the public appetite for spinning by sponsoring contests and and on the commons where all ages and social classes flaunted their skill on spinning wheels. It's just fascinating to me that this was so much a part of average daily life. But then something happened in 1699. There was a British law passed by the Parliament of Great Britain called the Wool Act of 1699. And it was designed to restrict the trading of wool products by banning the export of wool from the colonies, limiting the import of wool um, to that produced by Great Britain and taxing wool sales. So what that meant, and this, this was not just towards the colonies in America. It impacted Ireland. And basically what Great Britain was doing, this was the, the time of mercantilism, it was called. They would, they would put these heavy taxes on so that you had to go through Britain in order to market anything that you might be making. And so in the colonies, you actually could not, there in that law, you actually could not take fiber that you produced and cross over into another colony, Virginia or the Carolinas, that was against the law. That was against the Wool Act. So something started to flare up in the hearts of um, in the hearts of the people over here, and it was didn't just happen at the Boston Tea Party. So, anyways, um, the effect the Wool Act had was to force all wool and wool products produced by colonies to be sold to England and then the English sold it in all areas of the empire um, to gen and each sale generated taxes on these goods. So the colonists reacted as we should not be surprised about they were outraged and they vowed non-compliance. So they shipped half of the wool they made, they shipped half of their wool crop to continental markets 
and they carried on at home um, in their own industry prospering <laughs> I can't read my handwriting I am so sorry I just need to read it and then tell you rather than just reading it trying to paraphrase it so they shipped half their wool crop to continental markets and carried on home industry um, ensuring that they would not have to buy clothes or cloth from England so all of a sudden um, the colonists were boycotting fiber coming into the colonies and they were making their own they were making their own homespun stuff and industry won the laurels of the most prized virtue in the colonies is if you were industrious and you made your own fiber so in Dutch New Amsterdam which I don't know if you know what that became it was the southern tip of the Manhattan Island New York um, those colonists liked bright blue colors and reds that was their everyday worsted stocking that they would do and then they would add greens Washington Irving if you know who he was he's the one that wrote Rip Van Winkle and he also wrote a history of New York and in that history he recounts tea parties where young ladies seated themselves demurely in their rush bottom chairs and knit their own woolen stockings and he said these were blue stockings with magnificent red clocks going down the side I'm going to try to put a picture in here because I found some of those um, from museums and they're pretty incredible looking. So the ladies would knit silk stockings and they would embroider clocks down the side of them. Um, Nancy Bush has some in her knitting vintage socks. She has a pair of these in that. So women in all the colonies took their knitting with them wherever they went. It was part of everyday life. And let's see what else. Um, bartering started happening where bachelors or widowers who did not have a wife or some someone in their life who could knit for them would barter um, they would do handyman work around someone's home if that woman would knit them wool stockings so that happened a lot um, women advertised a lot to do mending stockings and also to wash them because washing stockings back then um, was kind of a chore <laughs> they got rather dirty and hand dyed woolen stockings were not washed as frequently because the dyes were really unstable then in the Massachusetts Bay Colony children preferred red stockings and wore them out so quickly that knitting them became a childhood requirement. So listen to this. Before four years old, a four-year-old could knit, they, this is how they started them. They started them by having them knit long, narrow strips to wind over the tops of their good stockings to keep them up. A four-year-old would do that. And then they graduated by the time they were four or five. They learned to manipulate the four needles needed to make stockings in the round. And they were assigned a daily quota that they had to do before they could go out to play. So this is a four or a five year old child could do that. So with cloth manufacturers such an indispensable home function the bee was born so we've heard of quilting bees and um, the first stitch and bitch was born 
This cooperative social activity was a highly anticipated affair, and one participated recorded the following in her journal. This is a journal entry. She never forgot how they talked and knit and knit and talked with tireless tongues, putting in marks at their narrowings, slowly shaping their socks with oft-repeated measurings. There was a charm in the very click of her needles, which seemed to keep time with the blinking of eyes. That was in someone's journal. So, we love so much to get together with other knitters, and this has been going on for a very, very long time in our country. Now it's recreational, but then it was a part of everyday life. It was a necessity. Um, stockings were the most commonly made item, and then the next most commonly made item was a mitten. Children were bound out as apprentices. They learned to knit as a marketable skill of housewifing. In orphan asylums, they learned to knit. In public flax houses, they learned to knit. And then dame, school, dame schools rose up all over the place. And if you read, if you were had a little girl and you read about um, the American Girl books, Felicity, she went to a dame school and knitting was taught, knitting and embroidery was taught as part of the curriculum along with reading and writing. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip over this. Um, what else? Um, the other thing, both male and female slaves learn to knit for their masters as well as their own households. And anything that they made beyond this, they were able to sell to get a little bit of money. Martha Custis Washington, the wife of George Washington, had her own personal knitter on the plantation. He was called Peter, I think. But she also was an avid knitter, and I will tell you about that when we get to Revolutionary War times. But as a plantation mistress, she tutored with much time and thought her household servants under her supervision in sewing, spinning, and knitting. So that is my little segment on colonial knitting in the United States. And so I want to start our Colonial Knitting UFO Knit Along. You actually, if there's some spinning that you've been wanting to do or that you've started and you haven't finished, if there's some weaving you've started and haven't finished or knitting, then please participate. Just declare your intentions and, and then we will go from there and on July 4th, we will have a grand prize drawing. So I think that's it for today, friends. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then think about subscribing. Um, please give me a thumbs up to get the word out there if you have enjoyed this. And if you haven't, thanks for stopping by. If you've lasted this long with my blathering, thank you. You guys take care. Remember what Elizabeth Zimmerman said, in the clicking of the needles, there is music for the soul. Take care. See you soon. Oh, and I totally forgot. I have an Etsy shop. And so many of you have asked about these bags that I have shared with you. Um, I have had several inquiries about whether I'm going to knit them, I mean make them, sew them, and yes, I am. I'm going to try it out. I'm not going to have a lot. I'm only going to do five at a time, I think. But you can go to the Etsy shop. There's a link right here below. And if there's one of these bags you're interested in, that's where you can get it. Thanks, guys, for stopping by. Take care. Bye.